because I have set my affection on the house of God, I have given. Our giving always follows our affection. Thank you. Thanks. 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 <laughs> it was kind of funny. First service, one of our younger pastors was announcing it's a rise and build Sunday and he couldn't remember the name of it. And Chris leaned over to me and said, it's encouraging to have a young man forget something. <laughs> so we've been feasting off that memory. As clear as I can remember, we've been feasting off that. And then he told us afterwards, he said he was gonna call it Arise and Conquer. So I, that's probably a good name too. Let's just call this Arise and Conquer, except It'd be more like, a, I guess, a destruction derby out there or something. All right. Um, grab your Bibles, if you would. Open to First Chronicles uh, chapter 29. And um, let me kind of try to set the stage uh, for you uh, in, in two separate areas. First of all... <clears throat> Almost strangely so, I have, I have focused on studying portions of Scripture for the last 40 years that have to do with building. But never once was it about building a building. I mean, it's always been uh, these, this prophetic language of Scripture is about building the house of God, which is people. And, uh, and so there are so many places, you know, from Ezra, Nehemiah to the prophet Haggai and some of the other prophets, they would talk about the rebuilding of a temple. For example, you've got Tabernacle of Moses in Scripture. You've got the Tabernacle of David. You've got the Temple of Solomon, the rebuilt Temple of Solomon. You've got all these kind of projects, if you will, and they all required something from the people of God. And I, I just like studying those. I've, I've just been attracted to them all my life. We're going to read out of, out of 1 Chronicles 29. I think I've only taught from this chapter once in these 40 years. So it's not like a portion of scripture that is a favorite because I like to teach on it. It's a favorite because of the, the impact it has on me. And, uh, and so we're going to look at that in a moment. My favorite probably uh, verse of anything to do with, with building would be in Haggai. Uh, two verse eight or nine, I forget which, but it's where it says, uh, and the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. So I would always read these, these chapters, if you will, these books about, about what God was doing in his people, the church, the house of God, not buildings, not organizations, but literally the person you're sitting next to and you, the house of the living stones being built together into this tabernacle of God's presence. And that for me has always been the focus. The, pro the problem, that's not a problem. Uh, the, the issue for me, the challenge that I've had is I tend to spiritualize things when God is wanting to naturalize things. And in, Paul nailed this with a phrase in 1 Corinthians 15, I believe it is, where he says this phrase, first the natural, then the spiritual. First the natural, then the spiritual. It's, it's possible to dabble in natural things and never realize the spiritual benefits or consequences. But it's rare to give yourself to the unseen, to the spiritual, and have it not affect the natural. So let me illustrate it so it makes more sense. It's possible to love people and not love God. It's impossible to love God and not love people. In 1 John, he says, he says, you're a liar. A very tactful way of encouraging people. You're a liar. If you say that you love God and you don't love people, you're a liar. And so there's this unseen reality that has to be measured out, realized, in some way discovered in the natural world. My heart has always been towards building up the people of God. I, I think in terms of that great verse I quoted a minute ago, the glory of the latter house be greater than the former. That meant so much to us 30 years ago, reading over that because it, it, it reminded us of the fact that here in the book of Acts, the early house, 
there was such major visitation of God and impact on nations of the world. Everyone in Asia Minor heard the gospel. Every single person, not one person was missed. The impact is astounding. And yet he promised the glory of the latter house, yes. which is our day, will be greater than the former. And so prophecies like that would just capture my heart and capture my prayer life. A song, we write songs or, or speak or confess, declare, things along that line that just basically says, honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. What, what God has already accomplished, he's going to only increase in the days to come. So this has been my food. Honestly, my, my personal cabin in the woods food, place where I go to just hide away with the Lord is, are these themes. Having said that, coming to a time like this where we are actually building a building, a rise and build, a rise and conquer, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are building something because number one, we believe it's in God's heart. Number two, it echoes in our heart. Number three, it's been specifically detailed to us by the prophets, yes. which is a very huge part of our life. Anytime you receive a directive word from a prophet, you've, you've got to have that witness by the Holy Spirit in you. That's the responsibility of every believer. It's got to be biblical, number one. You've got to have a peace about it, number two. And number three, you have to sense divine timing. So these, those three things have to line up. And so we have weighed this season together, praying, talking, planning together, trying to discern what has God already said about this. And oftentimes in our gathering as leaders, we, we will pose the question, has the Lord given us a prophetic word about this? Because sometimes he'll give you a word that makes no sense to you until the season changes. And then you realize, oh, it's for now. Now it makes sense. The season makes the word understandable. And so sometimes we'll have decisions to make and we'll just ask the question, all right, are there any prophetic words? Because we work really hard to, uh, it says they trusted their prophets and succeeded. I want my life to be that, that I trusted in those that God sent to me. And as a result, my life uh, illustrated the benefit of truth in hearing the word of the Lord, obeying the word of the Lord. All right. Having said all of that, there's many places in scripture about buildings. Lots, 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 lots. But my favorite is First Chronicles 29. And strangely, I think I've only preached from this chapter once. It could be twice. But, you know, for 40 years, you would think it would have been more often. So it's not like my favorite verse because it's what I want to talk about. It's a favorite verse because of the impact it has on me. Does that make any sense? I read through this because there's something in there that, that I can feel. It'll take us a while to get to, but I can feel this is actually supposed to impact multiple generations until the return of Christ. It actually has, it has, and you'll see in a moment, it's absolutely true. It has that kind of longevity on that word. It wasn't a word for a season. Some words are for seasons. Other words are to define who you are as the people of God for multiple generations until he returns. And that actually is what this chapter is about. So let's go ahead and start. This is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Got to, got to do one more thing. David wanted to build a temple for God. So it would be the grand, grand temple that Solomon ended up building. And he, he wanted to build, he had it in his, in his heart to build this temple. What's interesting is when Solomon dedicated that temple, he, he made this statement. He said, it's in 1 Kings 8. He said, since the time God brought Israel out of Egypt into his promised land, he never chose a city in which to build a house. So follow the logic here. Since the time he brought Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, he never chose a city in which to build a house. Very next phrase. But he chose David. And it was in the heart of my father David. That's stunning. That is stunning. Why? Since this whole thing began, God never picked a city, but he did pick a man. And look what he found in the heart of a man. <laughs> To me, that illustrates, I don't believe it violates sovereignty. I, I know some are, would be concerned when I say that it violates the sovereignty of God. I say, no, it doesn't. Because in his sovereignty, he brought us into the unfolding of his plan. 
And he actually, four times in three chapters, invited us into that relational context where he says, whatever you ask for will be done. We are not robots proclaimed to repeat certain words. We are not computers programmed to repeat certain words. We are people that get to, in a relational journey, get to discover his heart and then pray what we see. And he responds, and this temple that David wasn't allowed to build was in the heart of David. He saw it. And God chose the man, and look what he found in the heart of the man. But he, while he wasn't allowed to build the temple, it was because he was a man of bloodshed. He was a man of war. What, what does that mean? David was a man of war by God's design. He, he, he was designed by the Lord to be a man of bloodshed. Why? Because Israel had land that had been promised them that they didn't conquer in previous generations that they never were supposed to. It was supposed to be back in Joshua's day, and they didn't. So when David became king, they finally had the chance to get everything that God had promised them. So he was a man of war. But the Lord said, you can't build the house because you're a man of bloodshed, which means what? He's not being punished because he did his assignment. The Lord is trying to speak to us. I build on certain kinds of ministries. Some ministries are bloodshed ministries. They're, they tear down. They prepare the way. But the ministry of peace, which is what Solomon was, is the ministry I want to build on. So I'm not going to build on bloodshed. I will build on peace. The rebuke is necessary, but I'm not going to build on the rebuke. I'm going to build on the order, the peace that, that comes from responding to the correction of the Lord. I'm going to build on peace. All right, I, I thought it was a pretty good point, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just move on, hoping that someday I get another chance. By the way, we're, we're just thrilled with our whole online family that joins with us week after week. Thanks so much. And uh, I, I hope that together we can make a real difference in the world through what we're doing today. Arise and conquer. All right, let's, <laughs> chapter 29. <laughs> Sorry, we may, have, no, no, let's not change anything. All right. Uh, chapter 29, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through a number of verses. So please have your Bible open, follow it. If you don't have a Bible, scoot next to someone if you can. And, uh, and I'll do my best to go through this quickly, but thoroughly. All right. Verse three is where we'll start. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of God, I have given to the house of my God. Stunning statement. Because I have set my affection on the house of God, I have given. Our giving always follows our affection. Our giving always follows what causes our hearts to burn. Always. Always. Because I have set my affection in the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. David's personal gift had to amount to hundreds of millions of dollars of today's value. He set the stage for Solomon to build what he wanted to build, but wasn't allowed. But nothing could stop him from giving towards it. So he set the stage and incorporated the nation in the project. All right, jump down to verse six. Then the leaders of the father's houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands, of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly. You'll see this phrase, offered willingly, either that phrase or something similar throughout the books where offerings were needed. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah is a great example. They willingly offered. And the reason Paul would, would later capture this theme and, and tell us in the concept of giving, never give by compulsion. Don't ever let somebody manipulate you or make you feel guilty and so that you can then give. I will never do that to you. But I also know that because so many have been injured in the area of finances, you could understand what I'm saying and take it as a manipulative way. If you ever sense or feel that, do not give. Do not give until there is a joyful willingness in the offering. I'm very, very serious about this because the scripture says whatever is not of faith is sin. And if you're manipulated, there's no faith. You're being controlled. 
And you never want that. It's nauseating to see people use scripture to manipulate others to do something. It's just, it's not right. We're supposed to teach the word and invite people into this journey. Giving is a huge part of my life. I consider it my Disneyland. It is, it is I, I try to position my life. Benny and I have never given as low as 20% of our income. We always position ourselves around how can we love this person, serve this person, give to this ministry, whatever it might be. And that is the absolute we have found a delight and a joy in giving that we have found nowhere else. We only, one, one Sunday in my life have I ever given specifics of what I've done uh, in giving. And it was, uh, it was the week following some interesting articles in the newspaper. Uh, very flattering articles. <laughs> if you're into self-punishment, yeah. <laughs> And so, and so I took that Sunday, and the only time in my life, I literally just went through, this is what we do, and, and outlined it, showed everybody, this, this is what we do, percentage, everything. And the media department wanted to reproduce it. I said, nope, don't reproduce. I don't want anyone, if, it, if they weren't in the building, it wasn't God's will for them to hear it. So that's, that's, my, that's my deal. So the giving issue is, is huge, but it's the giving willingly that has been such a joyful part of life. So let's read on and find uh, more of this story. Verse nine, then the people rejoiced for they have offered willingly because of a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced. So what do you have here? You've got the first verse we read. You've got King David, extreme generosity. Second, what do you have? The leaders, those under his direct influence, moving into extreme generosity. And then what do you have? You have the people moving in extreme generosity. What's important is to see it has to start, if you're the head of your house, it has to start with you. You can't expect your kids to be radically generous in the way they think, the way they talk, the way they serve, if it's not being modeled by you. If you're in a business where you're encouraged, encouraging people maybe to do city uh, uh, services, some sort of volunteer work in the community, if it's not happening with you as the leader, it's not going to filter down. And it's not these people are more important than these. It's just the, the oil, if you will, in, the, in the, uh, the Psalms talks about the oil flows down Aaron's head, down his beard, down to his garments. It's supposed to flow this way. And what you see here is radical generosity entered the hearts of the people because the standard that David set was so extreme that even his leaders got infected by it. And their standard became so dominant that the people all joined in this joyful giving unto the Lord. Please notice, what David gave is, I don't know, it's probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars, literally. You see, David rejoicing in verse nine, and David also rejoiced greatly. You don't see any mention of hundreds of millions of dollars as being compared to $20, the $20 gift. You don't see that, why? Because it's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. He, he didn't, he, he never used his, his wealth, if you will, to show he was better than somebody else because it, it's, it's from the loyal heart. If you look at the terms that are used to describe this kind of generosity, it's the loyal heart, it's the virtuous heart, it's the willing heart, it's the affectionate heart. These are all terms that describe the kind of generosity that you and I have the invitation to move into. I was reminded earlier in our, our pre-service prayer time of, of uh, a dear friend of ours, Rick Joyner, Morningstar Ministries, a tremendous prophet and great man of God. He, he gave a word way back when, when, you remember some of you were around with the horrible collapse of PTL, Jim Baker and Tammy Baker and PTL and the moral failure and the collapse of that ministry. By the way, if you weren't here during that day, we had Jim Baker come back and very humble and apologetic a person, I, I never will avoid a repentant believer, no matter how much shame they have had to endure. We're gonna always champion them as much as we know how. And I'm not embarrassed to be associated with them. If I did, we wouldn't be able to read out of First Chronicles <laughs> because of David and his mess. So uh, I, I want us to be known for, for really uh, not, never excusing sin, but walking redemptively because Jesus heals, forgives. All right. So 
here's, here's, Rick gave this word that the Lord, a prophetic word, the Lord showed him that the Lord was jealous over the widow's might that actually built the PTL ministry. And that the Lord would not bless any business trying to take over this potential resort, rightly so. He's pro-business, I'm pro-business, so this isn't an anti-business word. I, I love to see businesses prosper. I pray for them, actually, in my prayer time, for the blessing of the Lord to be on business. When we go into a restaurant, I almost always pray for the blessing, the prosperity of God to come upon that restaurant when we give thanks for the meal. So I'm, I'm just let you know, I am in to the success of businesses. It's critical to the health of a nation. But in this context, the Lord gave a warning word that because God was jealous over the widow's might that built PTL, no business would thrive that tried to take over this resort. And it's exactly what happened. A, a business bought it, tried to build it into something, they crashed and burned. And uh, today it's a Morningstar ministry facility, which wasn't his intent ever. It caught him by surprise. But the point is, what is given here, whether it's the millions of a CEO or it's the $10 of a widow that sacrificed to give it. God is jealous over that. And I pray that we realize the full effect of that because what is given to him, he takes personal. He takes personal. All right, let's, let's get through this. Um, go over to verse 13. You guys still alive and breathing? Yes, all right, verse 13. Now we therefore, now therefore our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. Look at that again. Who am I that we should be able to offer so willingly? This, <laughs> this is a perspective on giving that doesn't come to any of us naturally. This has to be a work of grace. He, he's standing before the Lord. He says, I'm gonna put it in my terms. I'm not worthy to be able to give to you. But somehow in your mercy, your grace, you qualified me to partner with something that you're doing on the earth. His view on giving was, this is like the greatest gift I've ever received, is the chance to give to you. That's not a common way of thinking, but it is biblical. Who am I? And then he goes on and he says, and uh, for all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. Of your own. It, it reminds me of when I was a little, little guy, Christmas time would come. And we would want to buy our parents a Christmas gift. We had no money. So we would go to mom and dad and get money from them to buy them a gift. That's this right here. David is saying, all right, all right. You gave us the money to buy you a gift. Here, we are being really generous. <laughs> and that's actually the, the perspective of the privilege of giving. Say this with me. Everything I have, Everything I have belongs to him. Belongs to Everything I have, Everything I, have I, receive from him. I receive from him. All of our giving is, I'm sorry. <laughs> Special points to you. You just join right in. I love, I love that. I, I need to remember. Okay, don't quote me anymore. All right. <clears throat> That's awesome. The opportunity and the privilege for giving is a God-given gift. And when I give, no matter how sacrificially I give, Benny and I would give ourselves into a place where we were really hurting. But you know, you pray better when you're hurting. You, you, you pray so good about your finances, you know. So I, I, I pray brilliant prayers when I'm hurting. But we would give into a place of need and then have to pray our way out. And to be honest with you, it's one of the best things we ever could have learned was because it's, it's wrong for me to think I can give God $10 and I'll have 100 by the end of the day. Because then we become manipulators of the principles of God for our own glory. And yet, it is equally true that whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. 
The scripture says in Galatians 6, it is mockery to think that you could sow and not reap, that you could plant and not harvest. It's mockery of God. So to think I could do something in honor of the Lord, give, and not be a return. I realize we're, we're, we're wanting to get out of that mode of trying to control or manipulate God, but the fact still remains, giving is planting. Let's put it this way. It's a real stupid farmer that plants a crop and doesn't expect to harvest. He won't be in the farming business long. We do so in hope. What I've noticed in my own journey is I planted some crops 30 years ago that I'm only harvesting today. And the Lord knows when the harvest is needed. I've had it return quickly, and it's so encouraging and faith building, but that has to stick because the next test will not be so quick. And I have to learn to maintain the standard when there's quick return and when there's delayed return. Tell them hi for me. <laughs> Jesus is calling on the phone. Tell them hi. All right, let's get quickly to the verse. I've got just a few minutes left here. Go down to, jump to verse 17. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. So notice, notice subjects that he correlates, that he puts together. Uprightness of heart and generosity of heart. They're, they're, they're seamless in their theme, all right? Have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, I have uprightness of my heart. I have, I have in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy, I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. And here's the verse, the reason I wanted to read this chapter to you. O Lord, our God, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart towards you. Look at that phrase again. Keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart towards you. Why is this significant? David's my favorite person in the Bible besides Jesus. He was king of Israel, we know that. But according to uh, his ministry, he would minister before the Lord literally as a priest and yet he was not of the tribe of Levi but he administered to the Lord. So he, he was king and his priest. Acts chapter two says, and David being a prophet looked ahead and spoke. So David was a, almost like a, a forerunner, an example of Christ himself who would be king, prophet, and priest. Wow. David as the great prophet, let me change the language now to fit this situation. David, the great intercessor, is now praying for something that he wants to see actually mark the heart and the mind of every generation to follow until Jesus returns. I don't know if you find, I sincerely mean this, if you find something else he prayed for and declared that was to impact every generation, please show me, because I only know of one thing. Here's this guy who, who's, who's, has made his mark with God so significantly, he takes one item and he makes it his focus in prophetic decree and prayer. And it's that. Radical generosity would be the nature of God's people in the way they think and in the way they behave from this generation on. Every single generation marked with radical generosity. It's the one thing he chose to pray for. He could have, chose, he could have chosen so many other things that I would have suggested. David, pray for this, declare this. But he chose this because it seemed to mark, can I just say, his philosophy of life, his approach to the day, his, his realization of personal identity, personal assignment, all of this came out of this place is, is God has given me a gift. And the gift is, I have the chance to give. And he, he actually viewed this as a gift from God that I, I don't even deserve. I don't even deserve to partner with heaven to see his purposes unfold in the earth. And yet, I'm going to embrace my moment as a gift from God because I don't want to neglect a gift from God. And that was his approach. And then he prayed it. He says, in fact, God, let this mark the heart and mind of every generation to follow. That's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing that he would capture this one theme and say, 
Let this be it. Let this be the one thing. Integrity of heart, loyalty of heart, rejoicing, all these things all around this privilege of giving. It's, it's my Disneyland. It's a place I get to go to every week and sometimes every day. It's the most amazing privilege to partner with the heart of God and caring for people. It may be something grand like this. I mean, this is the biggest thing I've ever been a, been a part of. It may be the sandwich that you bring out of Safeway for the guy outside that hasn't eaten in a week. It doesn't matter where it is. It's just, it's the approach to life. It's, it's regardless of whether you have this much or you've just got this much. It's just the fact that you realize it is my privilege to take this that I have to sow into eternal purpose. Yeah, I'm so glad that you uh, watched this video. I do pray that it's a great, great strength and encouragement to you. And I've got a verse that really is my cry for all of us. And it's uh, Psalms 20, it's verse 4. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. That's my prayer. That's my prayer is that this would be the season of rich, rich fulfillment. Thanks for joining us.